Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the Islamic Center at New York University podcast coming to you straight from the heart of New York City. We're building an amazing Muslim community here at ICNYU where everyone is welcomed and respected no matter where you're from or where you're at. This is the place to be. So open your ears and your heart and come along with us on another life-changing journey. Bismillah. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحدينا وحبيب قلوبنا والشفيع نفوسنا بالقاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل وسلم على محمد وآل محمد. For today's discussion, inshallah, I wanted to take a look at a really famous sermon as narrated by Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu was salam. Sermon 209 of An-Nahj al-Balagha in which the Imam alayhi salam is in communication or is in conversation with a companion of his, a man by the name of Al-Ala ibn Ziyad al-Harathi or according to other uh, versions of this narration, a man by the name of Rabi ibn Ziyad al-Harithi, uh, along with one of his brothers, where he, the Imam alayhi salam, he teaches them or he advises them with regards to how they should see and how they should perceive um, their role and their responsibilities living in this transient world and not falling to its lure or not falling to its desire. It's not particularly lengthy, uh, this conversation as narrated within Sermon 209 of Nahj al Balagha, but the same exact report with a little bit of a different variation is actually also mentioned in Kitab al Kafi of Al Khulaini, uh, but for the sake of our discussion, if you'd like to follow along, we'll take a look at the version from Nahj al Balagha, which is Sermon 209, and, and seek toward extracting some. Uh, hopefully practical and, and beneficial lesson uh, for uh, the sake of our conversation. Bi'adhanillah. So it begins. Where Imam Ali alayhi salam, he leaves the city of Kufa. So this was during the time of his Khilafa. For those of you who are familiar, Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam for 24 and a half some odd years after the passing of the Prophet wasallam, he lives in the holy city of Medina. And when he assumes the position of the caliphate of the Muslim community, within the first several weeks, he um, transitions from the city of Medina and he establishes the city of Kufa for a whole host of political and military reasons as his capital and as his home. Uh, number one, it was military, militarily strategic for him to be in Iraq, uh, particularly with all of the forces that were surrounding the Imam alayhi salam, attempting his life and the life of so many other Muslims. Um, and number two, he also had found a lot of support from within, uh, uh, within Iraq uh, of his loyalists within the city of Kufa in specific. Anyhow, the Imam alayhi salam, um, he had appointed one of his companions, a man by the name of Rabi, or in this variation of the narration, Al-Ala, as either his military general or amongst his governors uh, in Basra. And the Imam alayhi salam had heard that this companion of his had gotten very ill. He was sick for whatever reason. And so if you read in the very beginning of this particular report, as mentioned within Al-Nahj al according to Sharif al-Rabi, uh, he states that Amir al-Mu'mineen went to inquire about the health of his companion. So lesson number one, before we even start to read this conversation that takes place between these two individuals, is that the Imam alayhi salam had heard that one of his companions had fallen ill. At the very least, our religious, moral, ethical responsibility is that when we hear that someone had gotten sick, then we inquire about them, we should ask about them, we should check in to see how they're doing. And again, it doesn't sound like so deep or so spiritual, but this small gesture 
like undoubtedly goes a really long way. Even in the famous report of the Hadith al-Kisa that we often recite, that when the Prophet salam, he comes to the house of Fatima, peace and blessings be upon her, he states, O oh, daughter, O oh, daughter of mine, O oh, Fatima, that I am seeing some weakness within my own self. I'm not feeling so well. So what does Lady Fatima salam, respond? She states, O iduka billahi ya abata min al that, oh Allah, I seek refuge when you're not well. You know? It's really easy when someone comes and tells you about their problem, about their difficulty, about their illness, about their financial problem. The Jews tell them, oh, like, I'm also sick. You know? So, so, so what difference does it make if you're sick? Right? Someone tells you, I'm really, really tired. You know, I'm not feeling so well. You say, well, I'm not feeling so well either. That's the normal response in the world that we live in. But over here we see that the you know, etiquette that we learn from Ahlul Bayt, peace and blessings be upon them, is that one, when someone from amongst their friends, from among, amongst their companions is not well, is going through difficulty, that not only would they just ask about them or inquire about them, but the Imam salam, leaves Kufa to go to Basra just to go and visit his, um, his ill, his sick uh, companion. Just one quick parenthesis, because again, we want to try to extract as much as we can from this not very lengthy report, that one day it is said that there was this really close confidant of um, Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, the Sabbath Imam alayhi salatu wasalam. And for three days, the Imam alayhi salam hadn't, hadn't seen him. And so it was the custom of the Prophet and of the Imam of Ahlul Bayt that when they would not be in the company of someone for three days or they didn't see them for three days, that they would start to ask. So it is said that Imam Musa al he asks his companions, his other students and confidants and whatnot, and he says, where is so-and-so guy? So they say that, you know, grandson of the Messenger of God, he's not feeling well, he's ill. So Imam Musa al he leaves his home, and he goes to visit this guy. And he not scolds him, but he rebukes him a little bit. And he states, like, I'm your Imam, I'm your leader, I'm, 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 your, I'm, I'm your guide. Why wouldn't you tell me? Why wouldn't you send a messenger? Why won't you why won't you figure out a way to tell me that you're sick so that I can come and like be that I, I can come and be at your support? Where he was upset that he could have not been at the support of one of his companions earlier. So in other words, what we should be doing is that when we see someone going through hardship and difficulty, lesson number one that we learned from Imam Amir al Mu'minin, that he makes every effort and attempt toward at the very least consoling that individual who is going through difficulty and hardship, at the very least, by our words, by our visitation. Today, we don't even need to do that. At the very least, you send an email, a text message, just checking in, and you'll see again, if we were to be a recipient of that, how good that we would feel, let alone uh, when we are the one who is sending it to somebody, just checking in to see how they're doing, it really goes, um, it really goes a long way. Try it. So it is stated that Imam Ali, alayhi salatu was salam, he goes to visit this companion of his. Again, in, in Nahj al-Balagha, uh, this man is known as Al-Ala ibn Ziyad al-Harithi, though most commentators would say that it is not Al-Ala, that it is Rabi, meaning someone from the same family, maybe a brother of his, someone from the same tribe, either way. And we don't know exactly what happens in the beginning of this conversation. We know that the Imam Ali Salam came in to check in, him, check in on him during his health, you know, with regards to his health. But more than that, the Imam alayhi salam, or this report begins with the latter part of their conversation. So the Imam alayhi salam, he states, مَا كُنْتَ تَسْنَعُ بِسَأَتِي هَذِهِ الدَّارِ فِي الدُّنْيَا He notices that this companion of his, who again was a military general, or one of his governors, or an assistant to one of his governors, he had a really high post in the Islamic empire under the authority of Ali alayhi salam. He notices that this guy has a really big home and like a really beautiful home. So he says, oh my brother, he says, what are you gonna do with this really, really big house? He says, you, he continues, he states, what will you do with this really large house in this transient world? Why do you have such a big home? The Imam Ali Salam, even when he came to visit someone who was sick, he made sure to teach them a lesson. Salam Allah he says, I think that you're going to be in far more need of this house 
in the world beyond this one. This world, you don't need a big house. In that world, you can benefit from it. Over here, all you have to do is live in a small house, <coughs> be mindful about your spending. In other words, that don't be so extravagant. Wabala in shi'ta balagta bihal akhara. But then the Imam Ali Salam, you know, you know, and again, this is so beautiful. Why is everyone sitting so far? Can everyone move forward? This is so awkward for me. Can everyone move forward? All, 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 the, all, the, all, the, all the women? This is like... Yeah. I should have asked you before, I'm sorry. All the way, all the way. Why don't you guys also move in the front? There's like these three nice seats. It makes my experience better too. If you don't mind. Thank you guys. Don't worry. I got a new deodorant spray yesterday. Come. <laughs> So the Imam alayhi salam, he tells him, ما كنت تسنعوا بساعة هذه الدار في الدنيا What are you going to do with this massive home in this world? أنت إليها في الآخرة كنت أحوج He says, you are going to be in far more need of this, wor- of this home in the آخرة, in the world, beyond this one. وبلا إن شئت بلغت بها الآخرة But I have a plan. I can give you the way, the method, by which you can take this house to the world beyond this one. So what is so common, like in many like Muslim communities, is that when someone is doing something wrong, the easiest way is to just slam them, right? I, I don't know what it is, right? I don't know if it's like a cultural thing or like whatever it is. Someone is doing something wrong and you just start screaming at them. Like I see, you see it online all the time. You see it with like religious leadership, you know, God forbid. Someone is doing something bad and immediately they're condemned, okay? The way that the Imam salam, speaks to his companion is not in condemnation until and unless he also gives them the outlet of how they should be behaving. It doesn't, it, it, it's not, it doesn't suffice that we tell someone that what they're doing is wrong without telling them how to make it right. You get what I'm saying? So it has to be like this two-way street. And this has to do with everything, right? In the way that you learn in the classroom, in the way that you teach your children, in all of aspects of life, it can't be such that we're only condemning without giving people some sense of instruction. This is exactly what we learn from just the method by which the Imam Ali Salam like speaks. Again, we don't know the earlier part of this conversation. Likely the Imam, well, absolutely the Imam came with compassion, with love. He saw that one of his friends was ill. So he left from Kufa all the way to Basra, but again, he also had to teach him his role and responsibilities. So he does it in this really nice and polite and really beautiful way. So he tells him, you have this really nice big home, it's massive, it's lovely, it's, 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 but it's way too big, right? And it's much better for you to have or for you to build a home that's this big or even bigger in the world beyond this one. But you already built this home, so I'm not telling you you need to sell it, and I'm not telling you you need to give it all in charity, but I have a way that you can take this home of yours to paradise with you. Then he states, alayhi salam, وَبَلَا إِن شِئْتَ بَلَغْتَ بِهَا الْآخَرَةَ تَقْرِي فِيهَا الضَّيْفِ وَتَسَلُوا فِيهَا الرَّهِمْ وَتُطْلِئُوا مِنْهَا الْحُقُوقِ مَطَالِعَهَا فَإِذَا أَنْتَ قَدْ بَلَغْتَ بِهَا الْآخَرَةَ He states there are three things that you can do if you want to take this house from dunya to akhirah. From this world to the next world. Number one is that you entertain in this home guests. Meaning that you invite people to come over. You spend time with them. You spend out of your own money. You purchase food. You make food for them. You give that to them. In other words, you host some gatherings whereby you're able to treat people well. Okay? And this is something really, really uh, incumbent and something really beloved in the eyes of Allah Azza wa Jal, within the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that he would love to host guests. And we see this within the custom of all of the Prophets of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. That famous story that I narrate quite a bit, when Prophet Ibrahim Alaihi Salam, he would never eat a meal until and unless he had a guest at his home. So he would literally look for somebody to invite for every meal of the day, 
uh, for a guest to eat uh, with him. We see this within the Sunnah of the Prophet wasallam. that he would always look for people to come and eat with and spend time with. And we should look and love that opportunity to host, even though it's difficult, even though it's time consuming, even though sometimes it's not particularly cost effective. To do that is beloved in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So number one, taqri fi hadayf, that number one, we entertain guests again in accordance with that which is bound within Islamic law, in permissible gatherings, and so on and so forth. Number one. Number two, wa tasilu fi rahim. The second way to transport this dunya to the akhira is to utilize this home of yours to build good familial relations. If you have a sibling, a family member who is visiting from out of town, you keep them in your home, he's telling, he's telling this companion of his. He says, if there are people who got into a dispute from amongst your family, bring them to your home and try to reconcile. Utilize your home to build familial relations, to treat people well from within your own family. And we know, right, that um, many families go through difficulties and hardship. And it's really, really important, again, and beloved in the eyes of God, to being the one individual from that family who's going to take it upon themselves toward creating opportunities for reconciliation. Again, um, we have hadith that tell us, for instance, that reconciling between two people is better than the performance of Hajj and Umrah. Reconciling between two people uh, allows for us to be under the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's throne on the Day of Judgment. All of these lofty hadith that tell us about the reward of just bringing people together, and particularly those within our own respective families. So number two, وَتَسَلُوا fi rahim. The second way you can transport this house from dunya to akhira is to uh, utilize it as a means um, to care for your kin, for, for, for your familial relatives. And then the Imam Ali Salam says the third, وَتُطْلِعُوا مِنْهَا الْحُقُوقْ مَتَعْلِعَهَا And that make sure that you fulfill or you discharge all of your religious obligations according to their time and to their amount. So if you have any financial dues, you have khums, you have zakat, you have payments that need to be made, um, if you have debts that need to be paid, then make sure that your home is not a burden in you doing any of that. Okay? to make sure that you are still fulfilling all of your religious duties and, all, and obligations. فَإِذَا أَنْتَ قَدْ بَلَغْتَ بِهَا الْأَخْرَى And if you have done that, if you're able to utilize this house for all of that benefit, then know that you can take this house from dunya to akhara. It doesn't mean literally that house. It means a house that's better than that one. Good? This is the first part of the narration. This companion, he then s- tries to change the conversation because he just got, con- <laughs> just got scolded. Um, he states, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, Ashku ilayka akhi Asim ibn Ziyad. He states, O oh, Imam Amir al Mu'mineen, I want to complain to you about my brother Asim. He says, What's, what's the matter with this guy? What's, what's going on? The, imam, uh, the, the brother says, لَبِسَ الْأَبَاءَ وَتَخَلَّى مِنَ الدُّنْيَا قَالَ عَلَيَّ بَهْ He states that, O oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, he has put on a woolen cloak and he has abandoned himself from this world. So the Imam salam, says, Bring your brother to me. So let's break this down for just one moment. You have this one brother, Rabi uh, ibn Harith, uh, Rabbi Ibn Ziyad al Harithi, who lives this pretty decent life. He is respected and honored. He has some really important position under the governorship of Imam Ali, alayhi salam, either a military general or the governor or the assistant to the governor. He has some lofty post. And he lives in this big home. And the Imam Ali salam, tells him how to make sure that he's not getting so attached to this home by doing things that are meaningful for his akhirah. On the flip side, he has another brother. This man has a brother who um, has worn the woolen cloak and he has abandoned from this dunya, abandoned himself from this dunya. What's going on over here? <laughs> During the time of Imam Ali alayhi salam, in, and really for the first several centuries of Islam and sometimes even till this very day, there were personalities 
who sought toward demonstrating a life of piety and God consciousness by abstaining from every single physical pleasure of dunya. No food, no sleep, no intimacy, no drink. They sought toward fasting during the day, praying during the night, and they had made this sort of, they had virtually created this particular story, suggesting that this is the means for them to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they had worn a woolen cloak in the heat of the summer, demonstrating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that even in this heat, I'm going to make myself sweat more, be more hot, and devote myself in dedication and in obedience and in some servitude to you. So this uh, brother is telling Imam Ali salam, the one who was sick, the one who has this post, he says that my brother, he has abandoned this world. So the Imam Ali salam, says, bring him to me. I want to have a conversation with him too. So what, ha- what happens? So he is brought toward the Imam alayhi salatu wasalam. And he states, فَلَمَّا جَاءَ And by the way, in the, in the version in Kitab al-Kafi, the, the, the brother Rabi, he says, this brother of mine who has put on this cloak and has abandoned this dunya, he has made his wife upset and his kids scared, like because he doesn't spend any time with them. He's only busy praying and worshipping and so on and so forth. So this man is brought to in front of the Imam alayhi salatu wasalam. فَلَمَّا جَاءَ قَالْ يَا أُدَيَّ نَفْسَهِ he states, O oh, enemy of yourself. In, in uh, the Arabic language, the word for enemy is adu. And odai is someone who is a small enemy. So he states, you have become a minor enemy of your own self. This thought that's pervading in your mind, telling you that you need to abandon this world in its entirety, is, uh, is, 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 is something satanic. Meaning, be careful. Laqad he states that surely that the, the, the shaytan has misguided you. He says, do you not have any pity? Do you not have any mercy on your wife and on your child and on your children? He states, do you think that Allah, this is important, he says, do you think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made all of the pleasures of this world desirable and permissible for you, and yet you don't take them? Let me give you an example to put this in perspective. You know, sometimes in the course of our lives, someone comes and like does you some nice favor, right? Someone does you a favor. Uh, and us, out of politeness, we say, like, no, you don't have to do that for me. Someone comes and they bring you a cup of coffee. Okay? And you say, no, no, I, I don't need your coffee. It's okay, I'm totally fine. You know? And we want it, and we like it, and we appreciate, the ge- and we appreciate the gesture, but out of politeness, we're going to refuse that initial like, gift that they're offering us. Maybe someone brought a coffee for themselves, and then they realize that, wait a minute, I should have brought a coffee for Sheikh Fayyaz. Sahar, she came and brought a coffee, and then she realizes, oh, this guy, he likes coffee, so let me not drink coffee, let me give it to him instead. Right? Number one, like, I'd be embarrassed to take that coffee. So I say, no, 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 I, I don't want it. Okay? Um, then you, you insist, no, 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 you, you should definitely have it. I don't want it. I want you to drink it. For my own self-respect and dignity, right, and anyone else's, more likely than not would refuse it. Is it haram for me to take her coffee, though? No. Would anyone think that it's really terrible of me to accept this coffee? Maybe. Maybe, maybe, right? But generally speaking, no, right? If she insists numerous times, uh, you know, you accept it. Over here, Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen is telling this man, Asim. He states, my friend, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made your wife permissible for you, has made food permissible for you, has made like moments of enjoyment and pleasure permissible for you, has made sleep permissible for you. Do you really think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created all of these things and made them halal for you, and you, you are going to demonstrate your arrogance in front of God or your self-dignity or self-worth and saying, oh, Allah, no, I don't need any of this. Like we, are, like we do that with other people. And this, he's saying that, oh, Allah, I know you've made all of this allowed for me, but I, I don't need it. He says, you're not that important. 
In other words, right, that we do not have that station in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it's going to be too difficult in this dunya of ours for us to manage without all of those things for an extended period of time, right? We can do it for 30 days during the month of Ramadan. But after that, it's not easy, you know? It's not easy to abstain from food and from drink and from sleep and from all of the other benefits or blessings that we have in this dunya. It's too difficult. So Allah doesn't obligate it for us for 30 days. He obligates it for a set period of time and that set doesn't go beyond that. So the Imam, alayhi salam, he states, أَتَرَ اللَّهَ أَحَلَّ لَكَ الطَّيِّبَاتِ He says, Allah has made all of these like, nice things for you and He's made them permissible. <laughs> I'll open up one, one parenthesis over here. Some funny anecdote. Maybe it's beneficial, maybe not. I have no idea. Quick, quick tangent nonetheless. When I was... Um, traveling a few weeks ago, somebody came up to me, and um, he works in, you know, finance and whatever. And he was telling me he's like, you know, not to like judge all people who work in finance, but <laughs> there must be a lot of people in this room. He said, like, Sheikh, I have a problem. I said, What's your problem? He says that I think a lot about money. He says I always think about making more. And he said that I'm afraid that like my attachment toward, you know, an increase in my savings, in my 401k, in my bank account, you know, like I'm, I, I obsess over it sometimes. He says, is this a problem? I told him probably, right? I told him probably. If we are like so attached to it and it's hard and it's difficult, um, you know, then, you know, we need to, we need to like reconcile for, 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 for ourselves and we need to think about some strategies to kind of get over that. So he said, okay, like, so what should I do? Should I leave like, the field entirely? So I said, I don't think you need to do that. I think it's about you know, finding like, some contentment. And sometimes we need to, you know, some of the techniques that we're taught within our hadith is to give, right? When you're so consumed with it, then you give it, right? And you give it until it hurts because it's not easy to give something that you're so consumed by. And then he was like being really hard on himself, you know? He was like, you know, but I, but I do give a lot. I give to this organization, to this institution, and I give this much money and this really significant percentage. And, see, and mashallah, he does. And he says, in addition to that, you know, to try to get myself like away from it, I try to make sure that I distribute to like my family, like overseas, and to my own family over here, and I don't neglect them. And I do all of these different projects and so on and so forth. And mashallah, he's a really generous guy. He said, in addition to that, you know, I started like devoting myself like more time toward my prayers. I started fasting these amount of days. He's really making this really strong concerted attempt, you know, during the course of his life to, you know, to 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 not be so attached to uh, this this dunya. Um, and then after he's explaining to me all of the steps he's taking toward breaking all of the shackles of attachment, I told him I said, look, from what you're telling me, you're making like all of the you're doing all of the right things, you know. And, you know, slowly, slowly, that attachment will break. And, you know, it, you know inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing you, like, from, from, from all of your wealth and all of your success. And, you know, you, you're doing the right thing. So he's like, no, but I can't sleep at night. I said, listen, you know, start to get concerned about this guy. He's doing so much. You know, I told him, you can't, like, start neglecting yourself or your family either. You, 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 you're allowed to live in accordance with your standards. So he's like, give me, like, some advice. So I told him, okay, my friend. I said, listen, in our religion, everything's haram. <laughs> Right? You can't eat this food, you can't do this, you can't do that. I said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us money, right? He gave us, you know, this guy who's really interested in cars. He said, I was like, well, you, he, you want to drive a fast car? You can drive a fast car, it's fine, what's the problem? You know? As long as you're not so attached to it that you don't do all of the other things. Okay? So in other words, the Imam Ali Salam is telling him, hey, my friend, he said, you have all of this. You have property, you have home, you have family, you have access to food. It's not that you don't have any of these things. You have all of these blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. And yet you're telling yourself that, no, I want to abandon all of them, you know, for your own self to the neglect of your, your, your family. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't work like that. He states, أَتَرَ اللَّهَ أَحَلَّ لَكَ الطَّيِّبَاتِ وَهُوَ يَكْرَهُ أَن تَأْخُذَهَا he says, do you believe that if you use these things, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made lawful for you, that he would dislike you, he would be upset with you? Impossible. And then he states, Inna Allah, um, Anta ahwanu Allahi min dalik. He says, you are too unimportant. You are too insecure. We're a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do not think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala needs that from you. He needs for you to fulfill your duties and your obligations, and that which is permissible for you is permissible uh, for you.
And now listen to this guy's response. He's confused. He thought he was doing the right thing. He was abstaining from food, abstaining from drink, abstaining from the pleasures of dunya. And he states, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, Haba ant fi khushunati balbasika wa jushubati ma'kalak. He states, O oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says, you're, you're, you're scolding me? He says, you are scolding me? He says, look at your clothes and look at your food. How does Ali eat and how does Ali dress? It's stated that Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wa salam, that the Imam salamullah alayhi, he would eat bread that was so rough, that was so coarse, that was so hard, that was so stale, that he literally needed um, to break it on his knee because it was too difficult for him to break with his hands. This friend of Ali, alayhi salatu wa salam, still. One day it said that the Imam, during his uh, khalafa, he was sitting with all of his other ministers and his governors in Kufa. And they had like their meal spread. And there was one particular like area that had a stamp or a sticker or the name of Ali Ali Salam on it. Basically, in our language, it said like, don't touch, this is like Ali's food, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, probably they wonder like, you know, he's, 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 the, he's the leader of the Muslim world, probably has like a nice steak dinner, right? And everyone else has to eat, you know, chicken, right? And uh, they all gather around and then, and then Imam Hassan alayhi salam brings the food of Imam Ali to the head of the table or whatever it was the equivalent of the head of the, the Imam Ali salam would sit on the floor. What am I kidding? And he like unpacked it and while everyone else was eating like some decent food, the Imam alayhi salam was eating this dark, coarse, rough, uh, you know, piece of bread. And one of the governors looked toward Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam and he states, you know, like, oh, Hassan, like, why don't you get your father some, like, you know, some butter or something, right? Why don't you make your father's, like, bread a little bit less stale, like, less hard? To which he, like, smiles back at this companion of theirs. And he said, you don't know my dad, like, do you, right? No matter what we do, he won't permit us to go near his food. And they would ask the Imam, salam, like, why do you eat this, you know, why do you eat such food like this? You have a right to at the very least eat in accordance with, you know, who you are. You know, you, you, don't need, you don't need to eat food like this. You don't need to dress in clothing like this one. Many of you are familiar with that anecdote when the Imam, alayhi salam, he goes out into the marketplace or he tells his companion, Qambar, his servant, Qambar, to go out into the suq and buy him like, a, 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 you know, two pieces of, of, of clothing. He says, buy one for you and buy one for me. And so Qambar, he goes and he buys like this really, really nice shirt for the Imam and he buys some really, really, you know, not nice shirt for himself in accordance with what his standards were. He brings it back to the Imam, Ali Salam, and the Imam gives him the nicer one and he keeps the, 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 the not as nice one. And he says, O Amir al-Mu'mineen, commander of the faithful, you are the leader of the Muslim world. I'm your servant. Why should I be wearing the nice one? He says, no, this is, my, this is befitting for my standard. And you should be wearing this. So this man, Asim, right, who is now being condemned for abstaining from the world, He's wondering, what am I getting in trouble for? He says, exactly what I'm doing, O oh Ali. He said, I'm taking your example. You know, you're the one who eats like this. You're the one who dresses like this. You're the one who prays like this. You're the one, you're the one, you're the one. What am I doing wrong? You know, go, go back and scold my brother for his big house. <laughs> it's probably, it's probably thinking. Of course, he didn't say that. This is from my own commentary. Sorry. <laughs> Bad joke, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay, thank you. قال, the Imam Ali Salam, he states, Wayhak. He says, Watch yourself. He says, Inni lestu kant. He says, Me and you were not the same. In the Allah Ta'ala, Farava ala aimmat al adl, and you kadiru an fusahum, the the afetin ness. Kayla yetabayyara bil faqiri faqra. He states, Woe upon you. Me and you were not the same. I'm not like you. He says, For surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it an obligation on the just leaders, on the a'imma, on the imams, such that they should maintain themselves at the level of the lowest of people so that the poor never cry over their poverty. 
Meaning that no one will ever say that, look at Ali, he has this and this and this, and I live in poverty. Meaning that he had assumed this position of leadership, so at the very least, he never wants to make a differentiation between himself, salamu alayhi, and the most poor within his community. And by the way, a lot of times people, they ask, like, did Ali even have like money? Did Ali even have wealth? You know, he is the leader of the Muslim world, right? He is Khalifa al Muslimin. In Islamic law, the taxes that we distribute, at least under the time of the Prophet and under the time of uh, Ali alayhi salam, the, these governors and these ministers who would work under the government, they would be salaried. You know, they would, they would have a right to take payment. The judges in the Islamic court, they have a right to take payment and so on and so forth. Imam Ali alayhi salam, as history is a testimony to, never took one penny from the public treasury. He said that I have my own earnings and I will never take one penny from the treasury of the Muslims. Meaning that my money will be redistributed to the poor. Salam Allah How did the Imam Ali Salam make money? We said before that after the passing of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for 24 and a half years, almost 25 years, he virtually lives in a, in, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a sense of isolation uh, where he distanced himself from the political elite. And he would do what he did with his closest companions and confidants in terms of teaching them, in terms of training them, in terms of commentating on the Qur'an and so on and so forth. But the Imam alayhi salam, when he was younger, his job used to be to dig wells. And he worked for uh, a Jewish merchant within Medina who he would dig wells across the city of Medina. After he had gained that skill during the course of these 24 to 25 years, he would leave the city of Medina and go toward the outskirts of the city of Medina at a location known, at a city known as Yanbu'a, uh, which still exists today. And the Imam alayhi salam would start to irrigate that land and he would dig wells in that land. We have a principle within Islamic law. It states, Al-Ardu liman ahyaha. If there is a barren piece of land that no individual owns, but it's the government, it's under government ownership, or it's under like, you know, no one knows who owns it, and for you know, decades, no one has utilized it. Maybe in New York City, you can't find that. You can't find you know, one you know, speck of land that no one owns, right? Either some realtor owns it, either like um, Jared Kushner owns it, right? Or um, you know, the government owns it, right? You can't find that. The Imam السلام, would look for areas in the outskirts, in, like the, you know, in, the, in the middle of the desert, and he would start to dig wells within these regions, and the, the principle within Islamic law suggests that if this is land that no one lives in and is totally barren, if you start to build on it, um, it you, you have the right um, to, uh, to, to own it. So the Imam السلام, began to dig wells. For these 25 years, he worked really, really hard. And he began to plant palm trees. And from the profits of those dates and so on and so forth, he made wealth. Till the time of Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam, when this is a quick parenthesis for your own benefit, after the Battle of Karbara, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, uh, after his martyrdom, Imam Zainul Abidin returns back to Medina. And so much of the life of the Imam alayhi salam was in between Yanbu and Medina, because he would go back and caretake all of that land that Imam Ali Ali, that he had inherited from his grandfather, Imam uh, Ali Ali, his salatu was salam. And the Imam Ali salam, the line of the Imam were very wealthy because of this investment and the time that Imam Ali Ali, salatu was salam, had, 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 had put in. Anyhow, so Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen would never take one penny from this public treasury. So he states again, in Allah Ta'ala, farada ala a'immat al-adli, and يُقَدِّرُ أَنفُسَهُمْ بِذَعَفَةِ النَّاسِ He states that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it an obligation upon me that I should live a standard which is as the weakest and as the poorest of the people of my community. كَيْلَا يَتَبَيِّغَ بِالْفَقِيرِ فَقْرَ So that no one from those in the lower socioeconomic class ever for a moment feels that they're not worthy, that they're not good enough, that they can't be someone who comes to me or speaks to me or seeks help from me, or so on, and so forth. So from this, we learn like a variety of, of different lessons. From the first part of the report, when the Imam is talking to the brother 
of al -ala, of 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 awesome, excuse me. He tells him that all of this stuff that you have, this massive home, this wealth, this property, it's all fine. Number one, providing you don't get so consumed with it and attached to it. And number two, that you know how to utilize the blessings that you've been afforded as a means to going or taking it with you to the world beyond this one. And he gives these three advices. Number one, if you have a big home, make sure you entertain guests. Number two, if you have a big home, make sure that you utilize it for your family and to uh, mend kinship ties. And number three, make sure that you don't forget your religious duties and responsibilities. And then when he speaks to the younger brother, he condemns him even more. And he states that this thought that you have of abstinence entirely from dunya is also a problem. And don't compare yourself to Ali. You have roles, you have responsibilities. Doing that which is permissible, is encouraged, is beloved, provided again that you um, pr pr provided that what it is that you do um, does not infringe on the rights of your family, of your children, so on and so forth, and that you are within the bounds of, um, of, 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 Islamic, uh, of Islamic law and um, of Sharia. And I'll conclude with this uh, famous report from the Imam Ali Salam as well. He states, Salam Allah Alayhi, ليس الزهد أن لا يملكك شيئا إن الزهد أن لا تملكك شيئا He states that surely abstinence from this world is not such that you do not own anything. It's okay to have things. It's okay to have nice things. But the idea is that you do not allow for any of your things to own you. Again, to not be so attached that that is the be-all, end-all, ultimate objective to our world. And that's the hard part. And it's a lifetime battle and a lifetime struggle. But if we see ourselves in those moments whereby we feel so connected and so attached to our property, to our wealth, to these things that we have, or it's the only thing that is consuming our minds, then again, like we said, there are multiple spiritual practices that we can engage in. Amongst them is to give, and to give until it hurts, like I said before, meaning out of your wealth or whatever it might be. Number two, fasting. Fasting on the 13th, 14th, 15th of every month, for instance, every lunar month is recommended. If we can't do that, then on the 15th of every month, for instance, at the very least. And if we can't do that, then to abstain how much we eat and how much we drink, uh, and to be mindful of that, number two. And number three, um, to perform the night prayer, to perform the hajj, to perform salatul layl. Uh, to wake up in the middle of the night is really, really difficult. And it's really, really challenging. And sometimes that moment, it doesn't have to be every day. It could start once a month, right? And then you can build yourself to twice a month. And then you can build yourself to once a week. That moment when you are in total communication and conversation, only between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sometimes it makes us forget about all of the attachments and distractions that we have of this dunya and allows for us to be more uh, self-aware and at the same time more God-conscious as well. With that we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for tawfiq. Walhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina wa nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala al-tayyibin al-tahirin. We hope you enjoyed our podcast. If you're inspired by the work that we're doing at the IC and want to help keep it going, subscribe to our podcasts, follow us on social media, donate to help support us at icnyu.org, and most importantly, keep us in your continued du'as. Until next time, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.